Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we're gonna be learning how to work with SQL Lite. Now SQL Lite is extremely useful when you need some database functionality and don't wanna spin up a full-fledged database like MySQL or Postgres. Um, so you can use SQL Lite for small to medium-sized applications where your database is just gonna live on disk um, or you can use it for testing and prototyping out an application. And if you have the need to move up to a larger database, then you can later port that over. And SQLite is actually part of the standard library. So there's no need to even install anything and we can just start working with it right out of the box. And it's extremely easy to use because your database can just be a simple file or it can even be an in-memory database that just lives in RAM. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is that this video is just gonna focus on using SQLite and not how to program the SQL language itself. So I'm gonna assume that anyone watching this video has some basic knowledge of SQL. And if you don't know SQL, then I do have a short series on getting started with the basics. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, I have some sample code here so that we have something to work with when creating our SQLite database. Now this sample code is from my object-oriented series. And if you don't know how to use classes or what this code's doing, then don't really worry about that. Uh, you don't have to understand it for this video. It's just going to be something that we can add to our database. And I actually have two files here in our current directory. One of these is the employee.py module that contains our employee class that we're looking at right now. And the other file here is called SQLite demo, and that's where we're going to learn how to use SQLite. So if I open up that SQLite demo, then we just have a blank script here. So right now, let's not worry about the employee class and instead just jump right into working with SQLite. Uh, let's say that we want to create an application where we have employees and we wanna be able to add, update, and delete employees from our database, um, as well as being able to grab employee information from that database. So in order to prototype out this application, let's use SQLite. So this is in the standard library, so we can just go ahead and import this without installing anything. So we can say import SQLite Three, and there's only one L there. And now we need a connection object that represents our database. So I'll go ahead and create a variable here named con and set that equal to sqlite3.connect. Now within the connect method here, we can either pass in a file where we want to store our data, or we can even make an in-memory database. To do an in-memory database, we'll have a string here and say colon memory and another colon. So that's how you would do an in-memory database. Uh, but for our example, we're gonna instead use a file name. And for this file name, we're gonna call this employee.db. So now with just these two lines of code, if I go ahead and run this, then I know that the files in my directory here are a little small for you to see, but it did create this employee.db file here in our directory. Now, I want to point out that if you're following along with me and you're using Sublime Text like I'm using, then I believe Sublime Text hides these .db files by default, and I have unhidden that on my machine. So if you don't see that, then you might want to uh, actually check the file system because that file is most likely there, even if you don't see it within Sublime Text. Now, that .db file isn't something you'll be able to open up and understand. Uh, it'll look just kind of like gibberish if we look at the contents of that file, but SQLite knows what to do with it and that's all that matters. So when we run that connect method, it creates that file even if it doesn't exist. And if it does exist, then it just connects. So I can go ahead and run this code again, and you can see that we didn't get any errors or anything, even though that, that uh, employee.db file already exists. Okay, so now that we have a connection, let's uh, create a cursor which allows us to execute some SQL commands. So to create a cursor, then we can just create a variable here, and I'm just going to call this variable C, and I'm going to set this equal to con for our connection dot cursor. And now that we have a cursor, we can start running SQL commands using the execute method. Uh, so we know that we want an employee's table. So let's go ahead and create that. So let's create an employee table that holds an employee's first name, last name, and pay. So to do this, we'll do C for the cursor that we created, C.execute, and then the SQL command that we want to run. So we'll say create. Now, one thing to point out here is that I'm wrapping this SQL in three co quotes on each side. And if you're not familiar, that is called a doc string. And it's going to allow us to write a string that's multiple lines without any special breaks or anything like that. Um, some people like to do this differently uh, than using the doc strings, but this is how they do it in the Python documentation. So I'd say that it's fine. 
And when I write a statement that's just a single line, then I'm just going to use the regular quotes for a string and not the doc string. So just in case you were wondering what I was doing there. So anyways, the command that we want to run is create table, and we want to create an employees table. And now let's put in some parentheses here and specify our columns. So our first column, we want to be the first name. So we'll just call that column first. And now we want to give this column a data type. Um, so SQLite has different data types than what you might be used to with other databases. And there's not very many of them here. And I have the data types page pulled up here in the documentation. And you can see here uh, under section two that there are basically five different ones to work with here. So we have null, integer, real, text, and blob. So for our first name column, we're going to use text. And for the last name column, we're going to use text. And then for the pay, we could choose either real, which is a floating point value, or an integer. And I think I'm going to go ahead and just use an integer, even though that doesn't give us decimal point values. So with that said, let's go ahead and set these. So we want uh, first equal to text, and then we want a last for the last name. We want to set that as a text also. And then we also want a pay column. And the pay, let's set that as an integer. Now I'm going to go ahead and actually indent this over to be even with that and save that. So now that we have our SQL statement to create our table, uh, now let's do a couple more things before actually running this. And what I want to do here is I want to do a con for the connection dot commit. Now realize there that I'm doing a connection dot commit and not the C for the cursor. Um, so this commits the current transaction and it's easy to forget this step. A lot of people leave that out. Um, so if you aren't seeing something in the database that you think should be there, then make sure that you're committing your changes. And also at the end here, it's a good practice to close the connection to the da database. And we can do that with a con dot close. So now let's go ahead and execute all of this code. And we didn't get any errors when we ran that, so that's good. So that created our employees table, and that will be obvious if we try to run this code again. Because if I try to run this code again, now you can see that this time we did get an error. And if we look at the error here, uh, it's saying that the table employees already exist. So that's good. So with that little bit of code, we're already able to interact with the database. We didn't have to install anything or start any servers or anything like that. Um, so let's comment out that line where we create our employees table and start adding some data to this database. So now that we have that table, let's add an employee to that database. And for now, let's just go ahead and type this in instead of using our sample employee class that I showed you earlier. Um, so above our commit statement here, um, let's say C for our cursor, C.execute. Now I'm just going to use regular single quotes because this will fit on one line. I'm just going to say insert into employees values, and now I want to fill in those that first column, last column, and pay column. So I'll do the name as Corey and a comma, last name as Schaefer, and for pay, I'll just make up uh, 50,000 there. So now if I run this code, then we didn't get any errors, so that's good. And to the best of our knowledge, that data was inserted into our employee database. But let's, found I, <clears throat> let's go ahead and find out by querying the database for that employee. So to do this, we're going to execute a select statement. So I'll comment out this insert statement here. And now let's create our select statement. So at first, I'm just going to hard code in what we're looking for. And I'll do that by saying c.execute. And now we're going to type in our SQL command. So I'll, select, I'll say select star from employees. And I'll put in a where clause here to find that employee. So I'll say where last uh, equals Schaefer and save that. Now that select statement is going to provide some results that we can iterate through. So to iterate through that query result, um, then we can use a few different methods here. So we have c.fetch1. And what that will do is it will get the next row in our results and uh, only return that row. And if there's no more rows available, then it just returns none. 
Um, so we have fetch one. We also have fetch many, and this takes an argument of a number. So say you said fetch many five. Um, so what that will do is it will return that number of rows as a list. And if there are no more rows available, then it will just return an empty list. Um, and lastly, we have fetch all that doesn't take any arguments and what that will do is it will get the remaining rows that are left and return those as a list and if there's no more rows then it'll return an empty list so for our example here let's just say fetch one because it should only be one result and actually let's go ahead and print out that fetch one and save that so now if we run this, then we can see that it returned our one entry that we inserted into the database. And if it can't find any results, so for example, if I change this last name here to Smith instead and rerun that, then you can see that fetch one just returned none uh, because it didn't find any results. So now I'm gonna go ahead and change that back to the way that we had it and rerun that. So you can see that fetch one just gave us that one result, that one row. Um, if we instead did a fetch all, which we talked about earlier, now if I run that, we still only have one result, but now it's within a list. So now let's add one more employee by rerunning our insert statement here with some different values. So instead, I'll say Mary, and I'll keep the last name the same, and I'll just put 70,000 there. Now, I believe that when we run our select statement here that it would do an auto commit of our insert above, but just to be explicit, let's go ahead and put a commit here. So I'll do a con.commit, and then after we commit that insert, then it'll run this select, and since both of these employees have the same last name, then it should get both of those with that select. So if I run this, then now you can see that our list from fetch all now has those two entries that it found. Okay, and just so we don't uh, insert any more values into our database right now, I'm going to comment out this insert statement here. Um, so right now, we have typed in the values that we are searching for directly into our select statements. But the way you'll most likely be using this in Python is that you'll have some Python variables and you wanna put the value from those variables into your query. So to see an example of this, let's start using that employee class that uh, we looked at before. And like I said, if you don't know what this code is doing, then don't worry too much about it. Uh, this class just allows us to create employees. And when we create an employee, it comes in and it sets the first name, last name, and pay. And the email and full name uh, use those variables to create those attributes, but we aren't going to use those in this example. So now let's switch back to our SQL light demo here, and I'm going to import that employee class. And I can do this because that employee module is in the same directory as the script that we're currently in. So I can just say from employee, import that employee class. And I misspelled that there, so I'll take that out. So now above my insert statement here, um, I can create a couple of instances of this class. So for example, I can say employee one is equal to employee, and then I can pass in values for first, last, and pay. So I'll just say John Doe, and for the pay, I'll say 80,000. And now let me copy this and make a second instance of this class. So I'll call this employee two, and this will be Jane Doe, and we'll do 90 there. And we can access those first, last, and pay attributes by saying, so we could do a print, and I'll do the first one here. I'll do print employee.first, and that will get the first name attribute of that instance. And to get the others, I could say dot last and dot pay. So if I run that, then you can see that it did print out the uh, first name, last name, and pay of that instance. And the extra print statement there is just the results of our select query, and we still have that print statement in down there. So currently, these two new employees that we created are just Python objects, and we haven't inserted them into our database yet. So how would we do this? So first, let's add John Doe to the database. Now, you might be tempted to do this uh, using stream formatting. And let me show you an example of what I mean here. I'm going to take out these print statements real quick, and I'm going to uncomment out this insert statement. So let's say that with this insert statement, we instead want to insert all those values from employee one. And like I said, you'll probably be tempted to use string formatting. Now, you've probably seen me use string 
more formatting in my videos before, but if you're not familiar with it, then basically we're using braces as placeholders. So instead of hard coding these values in, I'll put braces instead for each of these. And then we can use the format method to populate those placeholders. So for the first placeholder, we want, we want employee1.first. For the second one, we want employee1.last. And for that last placeholder, we want employee1.pay. Now, if you have seen this before and if you use string formatting a lot, this is actually a bad practice when using databases in Python. And that, this is the case for just about any database that you decide to use. Um, if you are accepting any values from an end user, so say from like a website or something like that, for example, um, then this is vulnerable to SQL injection attacks. And basically, all that means is that there are values that I could set these variables equal to that could break the entire database. And the reason for that is because it's not properly escaped. So let me show you the correct way to uh, do this. And there's actually two different ways, and I'll show you both ways here. So the first way to do this is instead of using our regular brace placeholders here, we can instead use question marks. And this is a DB API placeholder. And you also no longer need the quotes there to specify that it's a string uh, because it will know that by the values that we pass in. So I'm just going to do three question marks here as our placeholders. And now I'm going to, first I'm going to go ahead and copy these values. And now I'm going to totally get rid of the dot format. And instead what we're going to do is we're going to pass in another argument to this execute method. So I'll just put in, in a comma there. And for the second argument, I'll pass in a tuple of all the values. So I'll put a tuple, pass in all those values. Now, one thing that I do want to note here is that even if you're only passing in one value into a placeholder, uh, you still need to put it within a tuple, which can look a little strange. And I'll show you how that looks when we run our select statement in just a second. So I'm not going to run this quite yet. I'm going to show you the second way that we can use uh, the second proper way to use these placeholders. So I'm going to do another insert statement for our second employee here, Jane Doe. And this second way of doing the proper placeholders is my personal favorite. So instead of these question marks, we're instead going to put a colon and a name describing the placeholder. So for example, I'll do colon first and colon last and then colon pay. And now we're still passing in a second argument to the execute method. But instead of a tuple, it's going to be a dictionary. And the dictionary keys are going to be the names of each of these placeholders in our SQL. And the values will be what we want those placeholders to be. So in this example, this would be, like I said, this will be a dictionary now. And now our keys will be all of these values that we want to fill in. And the values of those dictionaries will be what we want those keys to be equal to or what we want those placeholders to be equal to. So first... So let me go ahead and copy this a couple of times. So now I also want this to fill in that last placeholder, and we want that to be dot last, and we want to fill in that pay placeholder. So we'll do dot pay. And now we wanted to insert the second employee here. So instead of employee one, this is going to be employee two. Now this line is getting a little long here, so if you wanted to break this up onto another line, you could. I think I'm just going to leave it the way it is for now. Now, even though this one is longer, the reason that I like this method of doing the placeholders is because when you only have one placeholder value, uh, I think it's a lot more readable. And we'll look at that when we run our select statements. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and run this code and get these employees added to our database. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And we're still printing out the select statement from before. But now I'm going to go ahead and comment out these insert statements. So now for this select statement, instead of searching for the last name of Schaefer, let's also run a select statement that searches for the last name of Doe. And we'll go ahead and use both methods of using placeholders just like we did, just so that we can get the hang of how to use both of those and how they both look. So instead of hard coding in Schaefer here, um, I'll instead use the question mark placeholder that we used before. So I'll say last equals question mark. And now the value that I want for that 
will just be the string Schaefer. And like I said, this is one value, so we still have to make it a tuple. So we have to put a comma here within those parentheses to turn that into a tuple. Now that's why I said that the question mark approach looks a little strange with one value because you still have to put it inside a tuple and that comma is needed or else you'll get an error. And I've just always thought that it looks a little strange. Okay, so using the other approach, so I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, these lines here and we'll do another select statement below. But now we're gonna use that other placeholder approach and we'll do another select searching for the last name of Doe. So to do that, we can say where last is equal to colon last. And now the way that we fill out this second argument is it's a dictionary and we wanna say that use this key last, which is going to fill in that placeholder. And we say that we wanna search for the value of Doe. And like I said, I think that this is a little more readable because even with the one value, it's a little more obvious that we're saying, uh, okay, we want this last placeholder here to have the value of Doe. So now if I go ahead and run the code that we have now, then you can see that our uh, fetch all after the first query gave us the two entries that we added earlier in the video. And the fetch all after the second query gave us the values that we added using the instances of our employee class up here. Okay, so we're just about finished up, but let me show you one more thing here that I think you'll find useful when working with SQLite. Uh, before I said that when we first make our connection up here at the top, you can actually set this connection equal to memory. And the way that we do that, again, is I'm gonna go ahead and fill this in. It's a colon, memory, and then another colon. Now what that's gonna do is it will give us a database that lives in RAM, and that's useful for testing if you want a fresh, clean database on every run. Uh, so for example, now I can uncomment out my create table here, and also I'm gonna uncomment out these insert statements. So now if I run this code, then you can see that we didn't get any errors, and that's because it uh, starts completely fresh. So every time it creates this table and inserts these employees from scratch, and you can just run this multiple times and not get any errors like, you know, the table already exists or anything like that. And it also won't, won't insert multiple values since it starts fresh every time. So I'll go ahead and rerun this again, and you can see that we got the same result. Now, since this did start from scratch, uh, one of our select statements here isn't returning any values because we overwrote those insert statements from earlier. So there are no longer any employees with the last name Schaefer. So the in-memory database is nice when you're testing and you don't wanna keep deleting a database file over and over and over. Uh, it just automatically gives you a fresh slate. And when you're ready, then you can just pass in a file and then your database will be stored just like we did earlier in the video. So with our database and memory, let's quickly prototype out a basic application where we use our created table to insert, select, update, and delete employees from a database just so we can tie everything together. And I'll also show you a little trick when we do this to make our executions more Pythonic. So to do this, I'm going to create four uh, functions here right above where we create our employees. And just so you don't have to watch me type these out, I'm actually gonna grab these from my snippets here. So I'm gonna copy these over and I'm gonna paste these right above our created employees. So we're gonna have some very simple functions here where we're going to be able to insert employees to the database, get an employee by their name, update an employee's pay, and delete an employee. So for the insert employees function, I'm going to copy and paste one of our insertions from down here and just modify it slightly. So I'll uh, copy this second insertion here and put it in here. Now, instead of inserting this exact instance, now I'm going to insert the employee that we pass here into this function, which is EMP. And here's a little tip for making your SQL light code a bit more Pythonic. It's kind of a pain that we need to remember to commit these after every insert, update, or delete. Now, if you know about context managers using the with statement, then you might be wondering if there's a way that we can use these with SQL light, and there is. So if you don't know about context managers, basically they're a way for us to manage uh, a setup and teardown of resources automatically. It's common to see these when using things like files also, because people don't want to remember to close files every time they open one. 
And with SQLite, connection objects can be used as context managers that automatically commit or roll back transactions. So transactions will automatically be committed unless there's an exception, and then it'll automatically be rolled back. So to do this with SQLite, we can say with con, which is our connection, and then within this block, we just want to put our execute statement. And now since we're executing this insertion from within our context manager, we no longer have the need for a commit statement after this. So now this is done. So now for our get employee by name function, let's grab our select statement from down here towards the bottom. And I'll just grab this one here and paste that in. Now, instead of searching specifically for the last name of Doe, let's instead search for the last name that's passed here into this function, which is this last name variable. So I'll remove Doe and search for that last name that gets passed into that function. Now, our select statements never needed to be committed, so this doesn't need to be within a context manager like our inserts, updates, and deletes. Now, if we wanted to return just one employee, then we could do a fetch one, but let's go ahead and return all of the employees with this last name. So we'll say return c.fetch all. So now I think we're kind of getting the hang of how this works. So instead of watching me uh, type in the rest of these functions, I'm gonna go ahead and just grab these completed functions here from our snippets, and I'm gonna go ahead and paste these in here. Now just a quick look at what our functions are doing here. Uh, this update pay function takes in an employee and a pay. And we are using a context manager here since we're executing an update statement. And we're basically just setting the employee's pay where their first name and last name equal the first name and last name of the employee that we pass in. And for our remove employee here, we're using a context manager again since we're executing a delete statement. And we're just deleting an employee where the first name and last name equal the first name and last name of the employee we pass in. So now let's delete all of the code from earlier and instead use these new functions. So I'm gonna keep the employees that we create there. Now I'm gonna delete everything except where we close our connection. So now I can insert both of these employees into the database just by using our new insert employee uh, function. So I'll insert the first employee and then I'll copy that and I'll insert the second employee and save that. And now just like earlier, let's grab all of the employees with the last name of Doe. So I'll say employees equal get employees by name and we'll cert, we'll pass in Doe for that name. And then we will just go ahead and print those employee results. So let's go ahead and run this and see if this is working up to this point. Okay, so we got both of our employees that we inserted. So now let's update the pay of one of our employees. So we will we'll set, so I'll do an update pay, and we'll set employee two's pay to, let's just say 95,000. And last thing, let's also delete an employee. So we will use our remove employee function and we'll remove employee one. And now let's rerun that same uh, get employees by name after we do all these updates and deletions and save that. So now if I run this, then we can see that the second time we print the results um, that John Doe has been removed and Jane Doe's pay was updated to 95,000. So that kind of gives you an idea for how you can use these functions uh, to do this work for you so that you don't have to keep writing these same uh, statements over and over. So I think that's going to do it for this video. Uh, hopefully now you have a pretty good idea for how you can get up and running with SQLite. Now there's plenty more to do with SQLite that we didn't cover in this video, uh, such as doing bulk inserts and things like that. So definitely give it a look. Uh, once you have everything from this video down, then picking those skills up will be easy. Now, another great thing about SQLite is that it also works with SQL Alchemy. Now, if you don't know what SQL Alchemy is, it's a popular ORM for Python that abstracts away a lot of the differences between databases. And I'll probably be doing a video on that in the future as well. But you could use SQL Alchemy with SQL Lite to get everything prototyped out in your application. And when you're ready, you could easily just replace that with a Postgres or MySQL database without changing hardly any of the code. So if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. Now, if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.